Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Jaswinder Singh from Parasit MRI Hospital, Patna, who's going to talk to us about growth modulation in children for deformity correction. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Jaswinder to tell us about growth modulation. So over to you, Jaswinder. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Janki. Good evening, all the organizers and all the delegates who are listening to this talk. So, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Is it all clear, Janki, and audible? Yeah, we can see that fine. Thanks. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. So, I'll be talking about growth modulation and what are the principles and just overview of the methods and rest. Once we know the principles, we can actually follow whatever technique we want to do and the details of the surgery. They are like beyond the scope then because as such for the uh, DNBs and the PGs, they should be knowing well knowing the principles. So this is a small talk. <laughs> so what is growth modulation? Uh, basically, it is utilizing the remaining growth in the pediatric uh, age group patients to correct if there is a deformity which is present in the limb. And usually this type of uh, correction is needed in the lower limb. It is less commonly practiced in the upper limb. This term was first uh, used by Dr. Peter Stevens. And uh, uh, there are various techniques of growth modulations. They are either temporary or permanent. So permanent is like we are kind of damaging the physis. So it will uh, produce a uh, correction or a deformity against uh, which the de the deformity was occurring, occurring. So if the physis is damaged on the medial side, the deformity will correct on the lateral side and come back to the medial side. The medial side will stop growing. Temporary are those techniques which are like temporary, which are there put as we will talk further with the examples, which are there for some time. And uh, once the deformity correction is achieved, we can just take it out. And that is also a catch point that we have to be careful that there is a certain time limit during which this correction can be achieved. And if those methods are not uh, stopped uh, working after that, they can cause overcorrection. So because the uh, all the growth modulation is working around the physis, so the prerequisite is that there should be a functional a working physis. It can be a normal physis. It can be a sick physis also. Sometimes where because of the sick physis, the deformity has occurred. But still, there should be some kind of uh, growth which is occurring in the physis for it the, for this method to work. Okay, so the next thing is uh, why uh, growth modulation? Why not an osteotomy? So osteotomy to correct a deformity is basically uh, it is one is it is a bigger procedure. It needs a bigger incision. It needs a uh, more uh, exposure, and this is basically uh, needed uh, at the time when the growth has completed in the child. So maybe like twelve years in a female child or a four years in a 14, 14 years in a male child, and it has inherent risks uh, like there can be uh, not complete correction maybe after the osteotomy uh, there can be non-union there can be compartment syndromes and so on so it means that basically osteotomy is better preferred once the growth has been completed so coming to as such what are the indications of the growth modulation so very commonly uh, after a conservative treatment of genu varum Varum. So, for example, here growth modulation is done with the eight plates. We'll talk about in details later. Genu valgum, like in this case, the eight plates have been put on the medial side of the distal femur and the proximal tibia to get the correction. In cases of limb length discrepancy, so if there is the there is a significant shortening on one side, and we want the other limb not to be growing, so that uh, whatever procedure we want to do on the affected limb we can do at the same time we want to stop the growth over the normal side for that we can do a, a growth modulation that that would be probably a permanent type like this was uh, done in this patient of dist in distal femur and proximal tibia both side the medial and the lateral plates are given so complete blockage of the growth is done here 
uh, one can use in uh, ankle valgus deformities very commonly like in this case it is put on the uh, meat plate is put on the medial tibia and this this can be secondary to like uh, osteomyelitis there is a deformity or there can be uh, multiple hereditary exostosis and more examples like that there can be a flexion contracture in the knee for example in cerebral palsy patient so this we can uh, say it a relatively uh, newer method so the eight plates are put anteriorly on and to catch the growth on the anterior side of the physis and so with the time as the growth occurs the posterior part of the distal femur physis will grow and the deformity the knee flexion contracture will correct of course that uh, it is beyond the scope uh, beyond a degree uh, through which the correction is needed through the uh, eight plates rather than just uh, i mean if it is just a hamstring tightening it is not indicated for that um, again uh, dr peter stevens had uh, described in uh, perthes disease to use the eight plate so this is like greater trochanteric epiphyseal this is done this is one of our cases only so uh, this is specially indicated in delayed cases when uh, like in grade three where there is has been already some extrusion which has occurred and healed in that stage in that case we do a trochanteric epiphyseal disease and with time there will be some valgus uh, orientation of the femoral head and neck and so uh, with the purpose that the alignment of the the weight bearing area where the extrusion has occurred that will uh, change to a more of a normal area of the femoral head of course after physial bar resection because of uh, any uh, indication for which is it was done we can again use for the deformity corrections so before uh, moving to what are the principles we should be knowing how does a physis work and what are the what is the anatomy of the physis so basically the physis has three layers a germinal layer or a reserve zone this is the zone which is towards the epiphysis so this is epiphysis this is physis and that is metaphysis so in the germinal zone there are reserve uh, cells and these there are the these are the cells which move to the next zone that is called as a proliferative zone in proliferative zone, there are the cells which are there in the columnar arrangement. And this is actually the zone where uh, many of the our growth modulation methods, they tackle or they work at uh, doing some changes at this zone. And finally, the last zone is hypertrophic zone where the cells enlarge from the proliferative zone. They get uh, mineralized and after that apoptosis occurs. And then they finally convert into the bone towards the metaphysis. So from this, we understand that the growth occurs from the epiphysis towards the metaphysis, right? At the same time, there is also some growth which is on the uh, diametrical positions on the sides. Uh, that is a different thing. And there will be uh, vessels which are contributing uh, to the metaphysis and the epiphysis. Mm -hmm. So side. So while doing any kind of uh, growth modulation or deformity correction, we should uh, try to preserve these vessels because this is the vessel which are giving its blood supply to the physis. So that is why like while putting an eight plate, there should not be much of the periosteal stripping so that we do not damage this blood supply. <clears throat> Coming to uh, the next slide. So um, before planning as, I mean, before doing the, what point is, the deformity is there. So we have to assess the deformity and we have to look for like if there are associated metabolic diseases which can be treated with conservative treatment, we have to try that first. And then we have to get a skeletogram done. So that is a long uh, film x-ray, the hip, knee and the ankle, the AP, AP x-ray together. And in this, there will be, as we know, we there are some important angles like proximal femoral angle, the medial lateral uh, distal femoral angle, the the uh, M lateral distal femoral angle, the medial proximal tibial angle. So from this, we understand uh, as the deformity is on the distal femur or in the proximal tibia and so on, whatever uh, values we get. So roughly the value is like for the MPTA is 87 degree and it is similar on for the LDFA. At the same time, we have to understand that when we draw a plumb line, which is from the center of the hip to the center of the an ankle, it has to cross in a normal limb through the center center of the knee. And it can cross 
either medial or lateral side, depending on what is the deformity, genovarum or val valgum. And at the same time, we uh, kind of uh, draw the zones at to uh, get a uh, basic understanding as how uh, severe is the deformity. So each condyle is divided into further half. So if the line is within the center and the half of that condyle, it is zone one. If it is beyond that and within the condyle, that is zone two. And if it is outside the condyle, that is zone three. So that is a simple understanding. So for a very severe deformity, this uh, the plumb line will be crossing outside the condyle, that is zone three, either on the medial or on the lateral side, as whatever is the deformity. Also, we have to assess as like for these uh, methods to work as how much is the growth left. So there should be adequate growth left for them to work. So a minimum of what is said is 12 months of the growth should be left. So for example, in uh, females, the growth should be the age for which it should work should be 11 years. And uh, for the females and for the males, it is at 13 years. That is a minimum at, uh, I mean, the maximum at which you can do. For, for one year of the gap for which this deformity correction can work. Also, again, the same thing to repeat, if there is less than uh, six months of uh, age which is left for the skeletal maturity, usually the growth modulation, the temporary epiphysiodesis kind of things won't work. And in those cases, we have to move ahead for the osteotomy or we have to wait for some time and do, do an osteotomy. Now, uh, this is a basic summarization of uh, uh, how to proceed. Uh, this was given by Dr. Raju Vesh and his team. And this was in uh, published in JCOT in 2017. And what they said is, first of all, confirm the deformity and assess uh, the physis. When there is a functional physis, get the all the skeletogram, all your workup done so that there is no metabolic disease. And if, if it is there, it should be corrected. Now, there can be a condition where the physis is open or the physis is closed or damaged. If the physis is damaged, we have to straight away move for the, go ahead with the osteotomy as we have talked. If the physis is open, assess what is the age. So, the age, uh, we have to assess the bone age as we have, uh, there are some methods like we can get a hand x-ray done and there are charts through which we can assess what is the age, skeletal age of the child if there is some confusion. At the same time, we can get a lateral X-ray of the elbow done and look for as a, what is the olecranon uh, epiphysis. And at the same time, there are again charts which will say as what it corresponds and what is the exact age of that patient. Again, these things are done uh, just to assess that if there is a child who is presenting near growth uh, completion and whether, whether whatever modalities we are planning, they will work or not. So it is better to get the those X-rays done in those children. So once the age is assessed, if the age is less than six years, and usually they are kind of physiological things, if even if it is not physiological, they can be yeah. uh, waited for some time uh, with all the conservative treatment. And wow. uh, thereby, if it is not getting uh, corrected, we can move ahead with some kind of surgical planning. If the child, according to their paper, if the child is more than six years, and uh, you, if it is pathological, especially like uh, genu valgum, should develop uh, a genovarum should be over by two and a half to three years. It, it The limb should become neutral and uh, it should attain a valgus position by the age of near about six to seven years. If that is not there, it it is probably pathological. And then we can move ahead with our whatever method we want to uh, take with a temporary epiphysiotesis. Again, if the growth is complete as uh, assessed from your x-rays, we can move ahead with the osteotomy and we can get a partial to complete correction. So, uh, uh, permanent epiphysiodesis and temporary epiphysiodesis, this is what we are going to talk about now. So, as such, the epiphysiodesis, it is a wrong terminology. Epiphysiodesis itself means it is a permanent. But now... Uh, because it has been being used from the past, so it is being uh, still continued. So permanent epiphysiodesis, there are uh, various methods. The first is like this was given by very early in 1933 by Femister and his colleagues. So this is a method of permanent epiphysiodesis. What they uh, did is they took out a rectangular physis, metaphysis and epiphysial block and they kind of reversed it. So the after reversing, they'll put the metaphysal on the epiphysal side, the epiphysal on the metaphysal side. And by doing this, uh, as the union occurs 
of this block, there will be a complete epiphysiotesis. So this is a permanent epiphysiotesis, which is which was kind of practiced earlier. Uh, there is this is still a principle one should know, but not done uh, now. The other thing like what we do very routinely is we can directly do a drill hole technique. We can damage the physis like uh, we do in um, uh, Perthes disease. We do a trochanteric epiphysiodesis with, just with a drill. We can also use a curettage or a power drill. So this was uh, given by Bovin and his colleagues in 1984. Uh, the third uh, kind of permanent epiphysiodesis technique is called as PETS. The complete name is percutaneous epiphysiodesis using transphysial screw. So uh, there is a controversy whether PETS is a temporary technique or a permanent technique. So for the people who uh, do it, they still say, and it was also given by uh, Dr. Medziu in 1998. And he also claims that this is kind of a perm, uh, temporary technique. Once we take out the screw, there is still some growth left. So what happens or what is being done here is, so there is a screw which is passed from the metaphysis to the epiphysis side crossing the physis. So in this case, we want to block the medial physis. So that is what is being done here. So this is a kind of a, a threaded screw. The threads are crossing the uh, physis. One can go with the oblique fashion or a little tougher is one can go from the medial side or from the lateral side, a uh, vertical fashion. So wow. this is how it works. Now, as it was said earlier, it causes compression at the proliferation zone. So that is what it, it does. And uh, that is the place where it attacks maximum. And where it is preferred is in those cases where there is not much of growth left. So basically, if a child present where only we feel like only six months of the growth is left. So that is a condition where we can use this technique. Also, uh, if we go to the technique, uh, the details, it is said that there is some amount of uh, screw thread at the head of the screw that is left while inserting so that one feels like taking it out, yeah, they, it can be done. So that is how the pets work. It is usually uh, more commonly done in Europe. Moving to the next method, uh, the various techniques that is a temporary epiphysiodesis. So the earlier what was done was Blount's staples. This was given as early as in uh, 1949. So first of all, how the blount, uh, the staples work is, this is the distal femoral physis, that is a proximal femoral, proximal tibial physis. This is a staple and there is a fulcrum of growth. So basically, there are usually three staples which have to be used. If we see like in the AP, this is how it looks. So the growth is blocked on the medial side, but on the lateral side, there would be a central staple a posterior and an anterior staple. And that is how it would look on a uh, axial section. So those are the x-rays. So the problem is the staple, it again causes a compression and it disturbs it disturbs the columnar pattern as was uh, showed earlier. And basically it kind of disturbs the end chondral ossification. So there are a lot of problems with the staples. As the staples work, there is kind of some backing out of the staples or the staples, they can also break. This happens because the, the fulcrum of the growth, this is the whole of the circle where through which uh, the geometrical fashion it works and it does not allow any kind of uh, uh, the, the edges or the spikes of the staples to uh, diverge as occurs with the, the eight plates. So as uh, we'll see later in the next slide. So the fulcrum of growth, that is why it is slow. It is uh, at crossbar and that is a, as said from the theoretically, the amount of the correction which is achieved by the staples is relatively slower. The complications already said there can be extrusion, there can be hardware failure and rebound growth will, that is we'll talk about in some more slides. So coming to the uh, the most uh, modern method of the temporary epiphysiodesis is the eight plates. So the good point of eight plate is uh, there is a single eight plate which is needed on uh, one side where, wherever we want to block the growth. Unlike the staples, like three of them are needed. Okay, the fulcrum of growth moves outside the physis. So as with the staples, it was somewhere here. So it did not allow any uh, further growth to occur. 
uh, it uh, and that is why the correction was slower but with the staple uh, with the eight plates because the fulcrum is outside the correction is faster that is what is mentioned uh, theoretically it has lower complications like uh, breaking of the screws or uh, loosening of the screws and coming out as uh, the eight plates this was given by uh, dr peter steven this concept was given by dr peter stevens in 2007 and these are flexible titanium uh, screws and plates there is one screw on each side of the growth plate and the screws they are they are non locking screws they are kind of cortical screws they do not get fixed to the plate and each step each uh, screw it allows a correction of up to 15 degrees so even after some time if we, if we feel that the not there is not a complete correction which has been achieved we can take out the screw and we can reinsert the screw so it will further if whatever amount of uh, degrees are left it it will further act upon that so there is again a, a method of sleeper plates i'll again be showing in the next slide so basically this acts as a tension band principle it blocks the growth on the one side of the epiphyseal plates and it avoids the compression of the growth plates which was achieved by the staples so this is the concept of the sleeper plate the so what happens what is uh, there are a lot of people who practice this so maybe like uh, at the end of one year we feel that there is complete correction done I'll, there might be a 5 degrees of over correction but uh, maybe the uh, there is still some age for the growth to complete so some surgeons do is they take out the metaphyseal screw and they leave the epiphyseal screw in place in situ and if there is some kind of uh, recurrence of the deformity it further goes back to the original so we can just go ahead and put this this screw back so there is again a controversy that uh, why this is needed sometimes there will be a lot lot of bone formed over this and it would be uh, more difficult to take it out overall this procedure takes just 10 to 15 minutes so uh, it is better not to leave so it is more of a personal choice rather again the length of the screws they should be not very long not very short but may they should be kind of uh, just a little uh, less than the half of the condyle and uh, as uh, already explained uh, if there is less than one year of the growth left it is better not to use that but still we want to tackle we can use the eight plates on the distal tibia i mean i mean distal femur and the proximal tibia together the next thing is these patients have to be followed at every 3 months because we have to see uh, at what uh, pace that is getting corrected again it usually takes one year to get corrected it is very important to keep these patients under follow up because like uh, we had few patients examples who had coming to us uh, during the covid time where they were not able to follow and there were lot of over correction which were happening so it should be well documented well explained to the patient the parents uh, before doing this procedure that this uh, uh, the this technique this uh, hardware needs to be removed at near about 1 year in cases of sick physis it takes near about 18 months to get complete correction so near about 1 and a half years so if uh, this thing these things are not well explained there can be complications so again they have to be taken out when uh, there is around 5 degrees of over correction next comes as rebound phenomena in 30% of the patients from uh, few papers it has been reported that once the eight plates are taken out there is a chances that the deformity will go back to whatever original uh, position it was towards that maybe not the same extent and this depends this mainly occurs in those patients in whom there was a initial deformity of near about 20 degrees or there was a very rapid rate of correction so we have to be careful again we have to explain the patient that still after taking out uh, the eight plates there can be a recurrence of the deformity so still be in follow up and uh, we have to be careful we might need to put the plates back sleeper plate we have already talked about and uh, in cases of uh, sick physis like uh, osteochondral dysplasia or syndromes it takes a little longer time for the correction near about 18 months so this was a uh, patient in whom uh, there was a genuvalgum and genuvalgum correction which was done by 
guided growth there were 25 children 37 legs 51 segment and this paper was published in 2010 uh in this paper the main crux what i wanted to highlight is the average amount of correction which was uh, seen was in the distal femur it was 0.7 degrees per month and 0.5 degrees in tibia per month so a total of 1.2 degrees or roughly just to remember there would be a one degree of correction which would be achieved by eight plates per month so roughly if there is a 10 degrees of deformities if we are going to tackle so it will take 10 months for it to get corrected so this is one of the examples this is a 13 year old child so just one year left a male child one year left for the growth to complete uh, we had a lateral elbow x-ray I was not able to find so this is a pre-operative his gait that is a genovalgum so we had put a distal femur and proximal tibia medial plates and those were the roughly in the zone to before correction the mechanical axis and after correction it is roughly in the zone one here and little over correction on the left side and that is the clinical VD on the after so this correction was achieved very early I mean within six months this was achieved of course the reason was we tackled both the distal femur and the proximal tibia together this is an, another child. Uh, he is 12 years old and with bilateral genovalgum. And uh, so in this case, there was some doubt that there is uh, the physis has already been, uh, it was not very well seen. So there was not complete correction, though there was some correction from the tibia. So later on, we had to uh, do the osteotomy for the right side and followed by the left side also after some time. So this, this is just to show that even after uh, I mean near maturity growth completion there, there can be a failure or there can be an incomplete correction so we have to go ahead with the osteotomy correction this was a child where there was a, a genovalgum deformity she was 20 months old at presentation and there was on x-ray wise the lateral femoral physis there was uh, it was not visible uh, there was a intraop uh, uh, dye which was arthrogram was put so there was some calcific nucleus which was available that is a pre-op x-rays so we did a medial epiphyseal disease of the distal femur that is at one month uh, so, sorry one year and there is some ossification occurring there that is how beautifully it has formed at two years and the deformity is also corrected that is a long limb x-ray and that is the I'm sorry, did not hide the face. Three years of the same child fell off when the plate was also removed. Another patient with bilateral genu varum this, this time. So she presented at as early as three years. So this was basically this was basically a Blount's disease, bilateral. So we went ahead with the lateral epiphyseal disease of the proximal tibia this time. And it kind of got corrected at 1.5 years of follow-up. Follow -up. But this was during the COVID time when she came at near about four years after the initial presentation. And there was a virus thirst on the left side. And we had to move ahead with the osteotomy for this patient. So that is all about the growth modulations. To conclude, in growing children, the angular deformities can be tackled with the growth modulation techniques. These are usually the simple procedures, and but they cause gradual correction. So one has to uh, well educate the parents as uh, there should be a three monthly follow up and there has to be implant removal at the end of near about one to one and a half years. And of course, for these techniques to, uh, to work, there should be adequate growth that should be left. Thank you. Thank you, Jaswinder. I think that was uh, fairly clearly explained and uh, showing a, a variety of cases where growth modulation has been done and with the results and follow up. So that was good. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, sir, while we are waiting for questions, just one thing, sir. Uh, sir, you have told that uh, in case of uh, eight plate, uh, there is some advantage over 
the other method what all if you can conclude and another thing sir you whatever you have explained during pets that is not uh, think it's a little Please, difficult yes yes okay so the first thing at present eight plate is what is advocated and what is used by uh, all the pediatric orthopedic surgeons first second thing is there were complications with the uh, the staples there were extrusions there were uh, breakage of the staples and uh, there has to be a bigger incision three staples to be used so at present eight plate works in all the ways it is beneficial it around it allows more correction initial uh, maybe for three months there will be a slower correction with the eight plates because they take they work on a uh, tension band principle there is also one paper which says that on one side the eight plate kind of blocks the growth of the physis and on the uh, other side of the same physis it also stimulates the growth but that is not uh, given by uh, more than one paper so in in many ways eight plate is advantageous that is the first thing uh, any more thing you want to clear in that? You wanted to ask yeah. about pets. Yeah. yeah. The second thing is pets, sir. So uh, personally, uh, we don't have much experience, but from the surgeons we see and from the cases examples, it is, it is, it has to be done when there is not much of growth left. So near skeletal maturity, maybe like only six months of growth left, and you still want to take a chance. So the pets is the tech. It, it is basically giving a, a kind of a complete epifusiodesis with a screw. That is a basic principle how it works. So yes, it does help in a faster correction. That is well educated. And that is why it is said that near uh, growth completion, the a, pets work from the first day as comparative to eight plate, which take near about three months for it to start working. So that is why pets is educated. So, what is the disadvantage of using eight plates when you're doing a growth uh, modulation for limb length discrepancy? If you're not doing def uh, def uh, deformity correction, but you're doing... Uh, a... So, it has to be, first of all, uh, from the growth charts, we have to understand that what is the exact time we have to do? What would be the difference of the... I mean, specifically for the eight plates you're asking, sir? Yes. Sir, I asked for eight plate here. Yeah. So what do you do for prevention of growth or length is you put them on both sides. Right, sir. Okay. So what is the problem that has been encountered in that? So maybe you want to... Uh, give me a hint or ask that it might work more on the one side and not on the other side though so, so no, there can so be what happens is no so it works on both sides but in the center it may not work so you get a kind of tenting of the vices okay okay so right. this has been shown and therefore they are trying to now find screws which go across so that the central part is also affected as much as the peripheral parts Right. Okay, so when you're doing it for deformity correction, that's not a problem. But when you're doing it for growth modulation to for limb length uh, discrepancy, where you're just trying to, well, which one side is short, you're just trying to shorten the other side or preventing the overgrowth on the other side. It may cause a tenting or a central tenting of the physis as a result of the uh, growth being stopped on the two sides and not in the center. Okay. Right. So, uh, there is one question asked by Dr. Subhansu. We want to know how to follow up for adequate correction. And if we did growth modulation, suppose at 9 year female and correction achieved at 11 years, when we remove growth modulation device and then deformity can recur and what to do to prevent it? <clears throat> so, first of all, uh... Do all the assessment, just uh, rule out that there's like there is no metabolic diseases which can be correctable. Once that is done and once adequate correction has been done medically, go ahead with your surgical procedure. Uh, at near nine years, if I put a, uh, I do a growth modulation, that would be a good time, nine years, ten years. So 
at three months i would be following up that patient every three monthly at near about 10 years of age i might get a good complete correction so i would do a five degrees of over correction and at that point i would uh, like to stop and i have to inform the parents that i have to take out the plate now sleeper plates i have already explained we usually do not uh, uh, follow that we take out but again there is a chance of uh, rebound phenomena as explained so one has to be careful with that in our practice most of the time uh, it has worked quite well and i mean it can occur with anyone there can be rebound so that is what there is if there is a deformity which has been which occurs again we have to tackle it again so there one of the things that some people advocate is to call, they call it the sleeper plate so they take out one screw and leave the plate there so that it stops yes. working as a tether and then if it's there's a recurrence of the deformity instead of having to put another plate back on they just add the screw on again okay so that is the concept of the sleeper plate for Having said that, we've not had to do that. We just tend to, what you normally do is to allow a little bit of overcorrection and then take out the plate. Okay. We've had one or two patients who've actually kept their plate on for too long and come with overcorrection. And in these, when we've taken out the plate, it's interesting how the rebound phenomena just corrects it or the ones we had just corrected themselves on their own with growth. So we didn't have to do anything else because there's a natural tendency for the human body to find the right line of growth. Okay, So they tend to correct themselves once the plate has been taken off. So the rebound phenomena does not cause further recurrence of the deformity but gets it corrected back to normal. Some people, if there's overcorrection, think that you need to do it on the other side. But we haven't found that necessary in the few cases. We've only had it in two cases so far. So uh, one more question from uh, asked was uh, that if there is a is there any role of growth modulation in recurrent patellar dislocation, and uh, what if any, then what would be the correct procedure for habitual dislocation of patella? See, uh, basically. For the recurrent dislocation of uh, petla, there is no role of uh, growth modulation first. We have to do a MPFL reconstruction as we do in our center routinely. At the same time, there has been a paper from Dr. Sheetal Parikh, if I'm not wrong, that after doing a growth modulation, uh, there was a case of petla dislocation. So as such for petla dislocation, there is no role of, uh, I mean, the growth modulation. No, I think the only situation you would do that for is when there is a associated yes, valgus yes, deformity. Yes. And there's still that. growth left, then yeah. you can correct the valgus deformity yes. with growth modulation. Okay. Yeah. So you would still need to do a reconstruction of the MPFL and you need to find out what are the causes for the recurrent dislocation. Okay. So if there's a trochlear aplasia, you may have to deal with that. But usually that is uh, rare That's that you have to do anything for that. You may need to do a tibial tubercle osteotomy in the older patient and a Rue Goldthwaite procedure in the younger patient where you take the medial side of the uh, so take the uh, take the lateral side of the uh, uh, patella tendon and take it across to the medial side. Right. So you medialize the patella insertion. And uh, you still need to deal with the MPFL which is usually deficient in these, and you may have to do a lateral release to get the patella centered. So, plus a medial ply, but medial plication was something that was used a lot, but doesn't seem to work. It just, just tends to stretch out, but if, in some cases it may work. So, for uh, the patient 10 to 14 years, I've already explained, uh, we have to get a, either a hand x-ray done or a lateral elbow x-ray done, and we have to assess that there are charts available as like uh, how much ossification has occurred, how much is the physis left. And accordingly, you can just follow exactly what is the age and how much is the growth left. Already answered that earlier. So, um, one more thing, sir. Is there any problem 
in joint orientation angle in that case is is there any risk sir, when we are doing growth modulation because Yes, it's not. Yes, so you what? Asking. He's asking so that, the distal femur and the proximal tibia, the lines which are parallel in a normal. That is what you are asking, right, Janki? The joint orientation lines. Yeah, that must be parallel to the ground. Yeah. So usually it will not disturb that. Okay. And just one last question, Sadin. Uh, the last case you have shown. And that's the first time in case of that pathological, that means bronze disease, uh, there was hemiaphysia disease. And second time it was uh, that osteotomy was performed. So, sir, is there uh, why? Because the child is still uh, within that less than 10 years. Is there any role of hemiaphysia disease? In so, any virus beyond three years is pathological first. So the, ideally, the virus, it should start uh, disappearing, the, which is called as a physiological virus by two years. And there should be a complete, from virus, there should be a complete neutral state alignment at the at three years of age. So at three years, if a child is presenting with virus, that is pathological and you have to deal it. And at the same time, if we uh, after three to seven years, one gets an adult valgus position. So this child had presented with a virus, which was pathological at three years of age with signs of uh, uh, infantile Blount's disease, which was managed by uh, a trial was, I mean, which was managed at that point of time. If one comes rather than doing uh, osteotomy, there was, and we got a good correction with the eight plates and later because it recurred. So we had to do a it was interesting. It recurred on one side much more than the other. The other side. The other side, we actually repeated the growth modulation and it was okay. This one, we had to do a whole lot of things. We had to do an intra-articular osteotomy, plateau hemi elevation, extra-articular osteotomy to correct the deformity, fibula osteotomy as well, and to do a rotational correction because very often these are very these deformities are a combination of various problems. Okay, so. We, this is not part of growth modulation, so he hasn't discussed that. But these uh, Blount's diseases can be very complex corrections. Right. So, so the answer question, was, no, yeah, so the answer is asked uh, what to do when there is a screw migration on follow-up and there is still some correction which is left. So uh, I understand two things from here. One is screw migration, maybe screw backing out if you are asking. So if there is still not complete correction, of course, you have to go ahead and get a better purchase of the screw. The second thing is maybe you are asking that there is a complete divergence of the screw and there is still deformity left. So you can take out the screw, put in a better angle, a more uh, less divergence than the original so that there is still maybe 5, 10 degrees of angle left and still it will work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the thing we have covered, sir. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so thank you very much, Jaswinda, and we'll call it a day till thank next you. week. Okay, bye. Thanks, thank everyone. Thanks, Yanki. Thanks, all the dedicates. Thank you so much, sir.